Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, okay, everyone, I'd like to uh, welcome Gabriella Coco here from the University of Pisa. Uh, Gabriella is a student of um, Antonio Sistanino, who has uh, uh, been a long-term collaborator from this lab, uh, with his people in this lab, back, uh, I think, 15 years or, or more, since he was an intern here, and now he's sending his, his, uh, his, his uh, students along as well. Um, Antonio uh, is interested in the sort of execution uh, environments for heterogeneous platforms, but he's actually interested in it because he is working on sort of machine learning, uh, sort of up approaches to machine learning which can uh, take advantage of this, uh, executing on this kind of platform. But he's also interested in it because he works for a startup as well uh, called BioBeats in California. He's working on uh, adaptive media uh, from, on mobile applications for the Apple and Android. Uh, platforms, uh, their image and audio intensive applications where he, he has to sort of hand optimize them currently for uh, taking advantage of the GPUs on the, on, the, on the client side, on the device side of, for those applications. Now he doesn't get to use this framework for those applications but in a sense he's building the framework uh, you know, for, him, for himself in a sense, in, well to, to enable better development in those kind of scenarios and also in cloud programming scenarios. Uh, so I'm a big believer in uh, people building tools for people like them, you know, building tools which will make their own work easier because there's no one who knows that work better, you know, what makes that work hard better than someone who actually does it day to day. So uh, welcome and we look forward to your talk. Thanks, okay, Gabriel. Thank you. Um, so I'm really glad today to, to be here to talk about uh, homogeneous programming and uh, execution for heterogeneous platforms. Yeah, I am on. Uh, may I get in close? Yep. And uh, okay, I will talk in particular about FSCL, which is a framework which is part of my PhD research in PISA. Stands for uh, F sharp uh, OpenCL. But I'd like to begin with a uh, with the problem, the, 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 or, or better, the situation today is that we, are, we have a lot of different computing resources available on the market, uh, CPUs and GPUs and uh, coprocessors, uh, like, like Xeon Phi, and almost every CPU that you buy today on a laptop or on a desktop system has two different resources on it, like uh, the CPU and an in, uh, integrated GPU. Also, mobile phones have uh, heterogeneous computing resources. Uh, say, and, and Android is, is supporting OpenCL today. Uh, Apple is, you know, uh, OpenCL was originally from Apple, but it, it, it is supporting OpenCL on mobile through a private API by now. And uh, we, have, uh, we, we have also access to cloud computing and uh, that is becoming heterogeneous in itself. Uh, for example, uh, think about the Amazon, uh, the Amazon um, services. And uh, users and programmers, with, I mean software users and programmers, are generally unaware of this heterogeneousness inside the, the platform they use. Um, and this means that uh, there is an overspending in cloud computing and inefficient computing because we are not, uh, people, users, are, are not using the, the best device they, they could use. And uh, so they have uh, poor performances. And if we think about the mobile develop the, the execution of mobile uh, being uh, poor in, uh, in um, for example, in, uh, from the energy point of view means uh, means a higher battery consumption. So the what is what's needed is a, a simple, high-level, homogeneous way to to code across these different devices. And, and the way, a smart way, a smart runtime support to, to get the most out of, it, of each device that we have from time to time, every time we want to execute a, a particular computation. Uh, so I think that this is uh, the, the key to exploit heterogeneousness. 
And in particular, uh, the homogeneous programming layer means uh, being able to port code and possibly performances, which is uh, much more difficult, across all the devices that, uh, that we have. And, uh, from, and behind the curtain on the underlying layer, there should be uh, a support that is not treating each device that is not treating the, the, the set of devices as an homogeneous set of nodes, but instead the support knows the differences between the devices to be able to exploit each of them uh, in a particular case, in the various particular cases. Uh, so, if we talk about heterogeneous programming, we have to talk about OpenCL, which is a specification for heterogeneous parallel programming. It is widely supported by Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, uh, Android also. Uh, it runs on, uh, on Xeon Phi, it runs in mobi on mobiles. And, and I think that OpenCL is on, on the track to, to become the, the, the dominant solution for, uh, for uh, heterogeneous parallel programming. Uh, nevertheless, OpenCL has some drawbacks. In particular, it is quite hard to, to program uh, with OpenCL. It's low level, it, it's error prone. Um, generally, in OpenCL, you have two things to code. The, the kernel side, which defines what the computation has to do on the particular device, and the host side, which is orchestrating or coordinating the execution. And this host side part is generally a boilerplate. It's really the same from program to program, but uh, programmers have to define it to, to execute the computation, actually. Uh, so there should be a way to automatize this, this code. And also kernels have to be, even though the code is ported, uh, kernels have to be rec com recompiled every time you move from a device to another device. So it's quite difficult to, to, to program on an OpenCL. And uh, from the other point of view, from the exploitation of different devices in a platform, uh, OpenCL doesn't provide any help at all, which means it doesn't provide a way to optimize for a particular device. Say, if, uh, if on my platform I have one only GPU, I would like to produce a particular code which is optimized for GPUs. If I have a CPU only, I would like to optimize for CPU, uh, ending up with two different quite different uh, code, uh, kernel codes. Um, so programmers have to, exp to, to write two versions of the kernels depending on, on, wh uh, on where they are executing the computation. If the programmer does not specify anything and uh, inside our platform we have multiple devices, it would be really, really great to have a support that helps uh, the programmer to decide where to execute. Because it has been demonstrated that some algorithms, generally those algorithms with a low complexity but that um, require huge data transfer, uh, are, um, must, uh, are more efficient on the CPU. So the CPU execution is uh, has a lower execution uh, completion time. And some other algorithms, for example, are more suitable to execute on a GPU. So how to decide this? Uh, to decide this, again, the programmer have, has to, to know the various devices populating the platform and the difference among them, among each other. So, uh, this is, uh, uh, these are the two problems that we are trying to face with this framework, with FSCL, which is 100% open source, is on GitHub. And um, this framework tries to address, from the top level point of view, the, uh, the need of uh, a simple, abstract, homogeneous way to program across, app, across different devices. And from the, the, the scheduling point of view, from the exploitation of different devices, a way, an automatic way to, to understand where to execute each computation from time to time and optimize code for that particular device. Uh, from the programming point of view, uh, we help programming for uh, uh, kernels, OpenCL kernels, by moving from OpenCL to inside F Sharp, uh, allowing, uh, uh, enable, uh, enabling the use of higher, de uh, higher level constructs and employing a, a compiler to translate F Sharp to OpenCL. Uh, from the other point of view, which means uh, exploiting different devices, we still employ the features of a virtual execution environment like reflection, introspection, and quotation and analysis uh, in, uh, uh, thanks to F-sharp, and a machine learning approach to optimize code 
and a machine learning approach in particular to, to understand on which device have to, to, to shed on a particular application. Uh, why I choose F sharp? I choose F sharp uh, for various reasons. Uh, I think the first is uh, the, the strongly uh, typed quotation metaprogramming support that allows to, to get the AST out of uh, arbitrary pieces of codes. So you, there is a very easy way to understand, transform, analyze, traverse uh, ASTs, which is the 90% of the framework. Uh, it provides efficient CPU execution. It is excellent for uh, domain-specific languages. Uh, the uh, functional programming is really natural in F sharp, but at the same time, it is possible to program in imperative or objective-oriented way. And uh, also, it is uh, open source and cross-platform. It runs on OS X, Android, Linux, and free. So before moving to the details about the framework, I would like to, to just give uh, a brief overview on the structure. So the structure of the framework is mainly based on two blocks, the, the compiler and the runtime. The compiler is completely independent from the OpenCL client driver, which is that program, that, that compiler, that translates OpenCL source code to, to, to the device target, for example, device target of an NVIDIA GPU or of an Intel CPU, and this uh, just because the compiler is producing OpenCL source code. And then we rely dynamically on the, on the uh, potentially available OpenCL client driver to do the final step of the compilation, so from OpenCL source code to device target code. And this is made possible by the fact that the runtime is dynamically trying to, to find an OpenCL uh, client driver on the particular platform where we run OpenCL. Uh, so let's see uh, uh, what we can do in FSCL from the kernel side programming point of view. Uh, I would say that the, the compiler at, uh, at a glance is translating F sharp into OpenCL. Um, this means, for example, that a kernel, which looks like a C function, um, in OpenCL can be can be written in, uh, using an F sharp function or an instance method or static method or, or, or a lambda. And this is the, the, the basic feature of the, of, of this, of the object model exposed by the, the, the compiler block. And, but the compiler and the object model and the API to program FCL kernels is much more than this. In particular, it, uh, I structured the, 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 the framework to provide multiple layers of abstractions. And uh, in every time you move from a layer to, to the upper layer, you, you increase your abstraction, you lose a, lit, uh, a bit of flexibility. So if we start from the ground layer, which is what I call the FSCL kernel coding or F sharp OpenCL kernel coding. The, the functionality, so the way you program uh, parallel computation is just as like as an OpenCL, but instead of writing C, you write F sharp. So you have the, the lowest abstraction, but the highest flexibility because every computation that I can code in OpenCL, I can code it in F sharp as an F sharp function. But even though the abstraction is low, I still have some benefits in working on a, on a virtual execution environment. I have a higher type safety. I have some higher level con uh, constructs that I can use without constraining the exclusiveness. For example, two-dimensional or three-dimensional arrays, I can use them, uh, while in OpenCL you, you can use only single-dimensional mm -hmm. arrays. I can use record, reference cell, structs, even though also in OpenCL you can use structs, and soon you will be able to use uh, objects. But I think that the most important th features here, here is uh, return types. OpenCL kernels must return void, which means they do not return any values. And this makes impossible to compose different kernels using the, the most natural way to compose things, which, means, uh, which is functional composition. But uh, enabling return types may, makes it possible to do this, this, quite, uh, this really easy and, and intuitive uh, composition of kernels. On top of this layer, which is, as I said, the most, uh, the most uh, uh, flexible and expressive, we build another layer uh, which uh, completely hides the OpenCL programming. And instead of writing 
OpenCL kernels as F sharp functions, uh, you use collection functions, which means array map, map to, reduce sum, also list, uh, mm -hmm. the equivalent of list that is, uh, uh, are supported. So OpenCL is, OpenCL is no longer viable, uh, visible. You do not see anything about OpenCL, you just use these collection functions. And since you are uh, putting yourself at this uh, abstraction level and you don't see any OpenCL code, the compiler is able to generate the best code out of array map or array reuse. So we generate two different OpenCL source codes depending on what you want to run, where you want to run your map. For example, a CPU has a particular OpenCL source code generated out of the compiler and the GPU has another one. Uh, well, so we have two different levels of, of abstraction, or you use a function, uh, uh, collection function, or you define your custom kernels. But the interesting thing is the third step, which means composing the two, merging the two, so that in, in, in you can execute uh, an expression that I call kernel expression, where I have a functional composition of, of many things, and some of these things are custom kernels, some, some others are collection functions. So the idea, the approach, is that as long as you can use collection function and do not program OpenCL, you can do it. As soon as a step of, of, of your entire computation, parallel computation cannot be described using a, a collection function, you just have to, code to, to change that particular step and switch to custom uh, kernel uh, coding without having to switch the entire computation to the lower uh, abstraction layer. And uh, something that is really experimental, I did it two, two days ago, is being able to put inside the functional composition not only collection functions and custom kernels, but also, I would say, regular functions or uh, sequential functions, so functions that, that are invoked uh, through reflection. And this enables uh, uh, what I call the sub-execution, which means, I don't know if you, if you have ever programmed in CUDA or OpenCL, but generally to solve a problem, like for example, reduction on an array or a prefix sum, uh, one kernel is not enough. You have to, or, or better, one kernel, single execution of a kernel is not enough. In reduction, you generally do iterative kernel execution until you reach the end of the problem, you get the, the, the end of the computation. In prefix sum, you optimize prefix sum, you have two different kernels to run iteratively to, to, to solve the problem of prefix sum. And so, since some kernels have to be executed in, a, in, a, in an iterative way, you generally are unable to compose them with other, in, in, a, in the functional way functional composition way. So the idea is that you can define your function uh, that takes the burden of executing iteratively a particular kernel or multiple kernels. So that function is the solver of the problem through the use of, the, of multiple kernels. And then you can put your solver that now is a, is a regular function inside uh, a kernel expression to compose it with other, with other computation. And this makes possible to compose everything uh, at the end. Uh, okay, so just uh, show you. Yeah? I hate to ask the naive question, but could you give us an example of what a kernel expression is? What, what a kernel expression is, is, a, is every possible uh, combination of, uh, of function calls. So it has not to be something so straightforward, but you may, uh, you may, for example, take a kernel where the two inputs, two arrays, are produced by the execution of two other kernels, for example. What, what is a kernel? Could you give us an example of a kernel? Yeah, yeah. the kernel may be, for example, vector addition, or maybe something more complex like, uh, I would say, Prefix on is a bit more complex in, a, in, a, in OpenCL, even though semantically it's, it's pretty easy to understand. Uh, it may be, uh, may be finite element, for example, the solution of a finite, finite element problem or fluid dynamics. It can be any problem. It can be a matrix multiplication or a, a, a decomposition. I think you showed us an example about six slides ago. 
The slide before the slide with two large rect red rectangles and two small ones there. You see this? Oh, okay. Yeah, this is vector addition. Ah. Simple vector addition. So it's, it's like a function, but it's, it is executed on, uh, on a GPU or a CPU, depending on the, the particular execution model of the, of the, of the, of the device, uh, through multiple threads, so pa pa in parallel. Uh, is it okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, so the, the way you, you compile this, if you want to compile this, and we'll, we'll see in a minute that generally you do, you do not compile directly at all, uh, it's really easy. You instantiate a new compiler, you can pass some options, like for any compiler, such as parse only or enable some optimization, and you pass the, the quoted expression, the kernel expression that may contain one single kernel call or a composition of kernel calls. Uh, the result of this compilation is pretty complex. Uh, it doesn't have, contains only the OpenCL source code, but many information that are generated, uh, such as permitted, uh, permitted access analysis or uh, information on the reference uh, data types, uh, on the used data types inside the, the, the kernels. Uh, this is all returned when you compile it, and the runtime uh, use uh, leverage and disinformation to, for, to optimize execution of kernels. Uh, so just uh, a brief summary uh, on how a programmer should generally approach to FCL programming. As I said, generally you use a uh, collection function. They are really straightforward, intuitive, so you're really easy to use. You can compose them. As, uh, as, as far as this is expressive enough to, to realize your computation. And when a, when a step of this composition uh, cannot be described using a, a collection function, you have only to change it. So to define your custom kernel, uh, put a reflected definition attribute to, to, an, to allow the, the, the compiler and the runtime to spec the code, the AST, and then uh, replace your collection function with a call to, the, uh, to the, your custom kernel. Uh, Sometimes you have some iterative kernels to execute, uh, like in reduction or scan, and in this case, what you do, since you can't compose that kernel in this way, because it requires to be, to be executed uh, multiple times, you, you put it inside a, a sequential function, a classic function that takes about enough executing it and returning the result of the problem. And so then you can, you can compose the solution of the problem with other computations. Uh, sometimes it also happens that uh, the sequential composition is not expressive to, to compose the kernels. Because, for example, one of the kernel is taking, wants to, or needs to take the result from the preceding kernel and from the first kernel of your computation. So it's quite difficult to pass data in this way or to model data <coughs> passing in this way. So what you can do is to split the, the expression into sub-expressions and run them, each of them sequentially, and uh, uh, the semantic uh, of the execution is the same, but uh, the, in this case, you have, I have a pointer here, in this case, my kernel and now have access of everything that is written and that is visible outside, so all the side effects generated by these. Uh, not only here that he, it had access only to the, to the result of the, pre, of the, the preceding kernel. So if, uh, if functional composition is not enough, you can split it. So this is the way uh, you can program uh, kernels, but obviously you have also to define, so you should define what a computation has to do, but obviously you, you should also define how a computation has to execute. And this is the runtime, uh, the FCI runtime. Uh, which takes the burden of executing the, the code that, that, is generating, that is generated from the compiler. Uh, generally, as I already mentioned, uh, programmers are not interacting with the compiler at all. They are interacting with the runtime, so they do not ask to compile a, a quoted expression. They ask to run a quoted expression. 
And under the hood, the, the runtime is interacting with the compiler to get the OpenCL source code out of the F sharp one and then uh, to execute a computation a returning, returning eventually the, the value to the programmer. Which means that uh, from the programmer point of view, executing something in parallel using FSCL. Uh, is just as like as evaluating the expression itself. It's really, the, the syntax is really similar. It's the same as, except for uh, instead of eval, we have run. And also, the semantic is the same in the sense that when we evaluating an expression, which mean, means uh, execute the, the expression, what is inside the, quote, the quotation, return the result. And also in, in FSCL, but the runtime is support is different. So we are running in OpenCL instead of sequentially on the CPU. And the structure of the runtime is, is layered in this way as a stack uh, as for the compiler. And, and also in this case, we have uh, less or more abstraction depending on the case where you are uh, putting yourself while programming. And in particular, the, the topmost is the most interesting one, which uh, allows to run a, a, a computation, a parallel computation, with one only method call, which is run. And so you do not have to do all the things that you have to do uh, in, the ho in what I mentioned uh, early was uh, the host side coding. So coordinating the computation, creating buffer, allocating buffers, uh, allocating, initializing data transfer, synchronization with the device. All this burden is, is transparent now to the programmer and is handled automatically by the FCR runtime. Which means that I can move from OpenCL side coding, this is for a vector addition, which by the way, it is one line of kernel code, it's really one line and requires 80 lines of code to set up the computation, to set up arguments, a lot of things. While in FSCL, you have only to write one line of code. Really we need to computation. Sorry? Computation. computation. Is, is that just a yeah, 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 yeah. This is not part of this code, anyway. So the, what, what is called computation down there is, is a generic kernel and uh, that is not part of this code at all. So 80 lines is, to, is excluding the definition of computation. So it's a fair comparison, I think. Right? So yeah, you, yeah, this is not a kernel. This is only to execute a kernel. So the kernel is inside another, another file. You could do it one line at about 95 characters. <laughs> yeah. No, you that's. You can make an anonymous function which takes a, etc. Sorry. You can make an anonymous function inside the. Um, the the quotation. quotation? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a bit. Uh, it's a bit slower from the performance point of view because I have to create a new DLL uh, on, a, on a, a new module on the fly because I have to give a name to that thing before executing on OpenCL. So I have to generate a name for that and to expose it to the rest of the compiler steps in a, in a way that, is, that really looks like the, uh, a dynamic method or a method itself. So, uh, so I have to uniform the way the rest of the compiler steps see uh, uh, an anonymous method or a static uh, instance method. So it's a, bit, it's a bit slower, but you can definitely use it. Uh, Okay, so even though it is so abstract, this, uh, this so high level, this type of execution, we are trying to make it to keep high performances. This is particularly done through two different strategies. The first is called buffer storage or buffer pool. And so every time I find uh, the, a kernel that is, uh, that is using a particular array, so the parameter is, is a particular, um, uh, the actual argument for a, for a parameter is a particular array, I create a buffer for it. But I, uh, I store it locally so that uh, every time I find the same array used by another kernel, I reuse the same buffer without reallocating, and, uh, reallocating it. And also behind the curtain in the runtime, we are trying to emulate all the good choices of a CUDA or OpenCL programmer, which means, for example, that if a buffer is read-only, 
I do not transfer it read only, which means it is, it is only read by the, the inside the kernel body. I do not transfer its content back to the device to to the host when the computation ends because it has not been modified. And uh, yeah, the, the, um, then for example, if uh, the target device is a CPU, I use particular memory flags for allocations and particular options for to allocate buffers which are more suitable. For, uh, for a CPU device, I uh, try to implement some strategies. But sometimes we want to break this layer of abstraction and try to have more control on the execution of a particular uh, computation. And you can do this using custom attributes. Custom attributes can be associated to parameters or to entire kernels, depending on what you want, what is the metadata that you want to associate to. For example, you can associate, uh, you can use custom attributes to control the way data are transferred forth and back the device. Uh, or to, to say something like use these particular OpenCL memory flags, these particular OpenCL options for the allocation of the buffer matching a particular parameter. Or you can use, uh, in, for example, custom attributes marking the entire kernel to force the device used to execute a particular device. And show this here. And also you can uh, use, instead of custom attributes, you can use functions, homonymous functions, that wraps uh, actual arguments or, or the, the kernel call to, to change these options dynamically. Uh, at the very end, if you want to have the full control of the computation, you can break this other layer of abstraction and go to the ground and, uh, and, uh, and use this kind of uh, approach where I explicitly define what happens before executing a computation and after the execution of the computation in terms of how to allocate buffers and how to trans transfer data. And now I have the full control of, of the, the kernel setup. So there are three levels of abstractions. I can, as long as it's fine for me, I can simply say run. But if I, have, if I want to have full control, I can break down to this layer of abstraction where I have complete control without escaping the framework itself. We are still in, open, in, uh, in FSCL. But uh, one big part, which is the part where on, on which I'm working uh, right now, is uh, we said a lot of time previously, if the device type is a CPU, I use particular memory flex. I said, uh, if the device type, uh, depending on the device type, the, uh, a particular uh, f collection function can generate, the compiler can generate out of it different source code. But who defines which device should be used? So this is the part where I'm working. And uh, in particular, the runtime is integrating a uh, scheduling engine, which is, uh, which is whose goal is to detect which is the best device where to execute each computation that I want to run. Uh, so at the very beginning, I thought to, to use uh, different uh, popular and uh, quite reliable uh, performance models to, to understand which is to, to predict the completion time of the various devices I have and, and use this strategy to select the device. But the problem is that we have to cope with very a huge plenty of different models for GPUs, for APUs, so we have a CPU, but also an integrated GPU with a, a different communication across domain. It's called communication model, so between the, the, the two devices into the same chipset. And we should model it. Uh, the Xeon Phi, there, are no, there is not a plenty of different uh, performance model for Xeon Phi, not yet. So it's difficult to, to find the best the, uh, um, execution mo uh, performance model for each device. And, um, and on top of all, merging these different, uh, dif 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 different models. Some models uh, aim to be uh, really, really precise, so they try to uh, they insert inside a formula that gets you the performance um, some parameters that are really difficult to extract using micro benchmarks such as uh, i don 't know cache latency and if those parameters uh, have to be set 
using uh, by, by the programmer or by the user to understand uh, the, the performance of a particular device, so the abstraction is broken. Because now the, the user, the programmer, has visibility of what's behind. So we decided to go uh, to, for a different approach, uh, machine learning based. And in particular, what we do is we use uh, a training set, uh, also customizable training set of different algorithms, matrix addition, matrix multiplication, various, various types of convolutions, and prefix sum and Mandelbrot, trying to be heterogeneous, which means different computation with different uh, things going on in their bodies. And uh, we extract from each of them a set of features, where a feature may be the number of memory accesses uh, or uh, also the shape of memory access. So, so if they are contiguous or interleaved, of, uh, which offset we use, we try to understand how branches are nested and uh, how um, we use, for example, barrier to synchronize the threads. And all these features are extracted from the, tra from the classifier to, to train it. And then, we get, uh, obviously, we get the, also the completion time for all the devices dynamically available on the system. So to detect for each training set how the features relate to a particular convenience on, on one of the devices. And then, for each computation that I want to, want to execute successfully, uh, uh, what I do, I extract the same features from the computation and I ask the, the, the classifier where I should run it, which means one of the n classes I have to choose for, for uh, the, the particular computation belongs to. And uh, this is, I'm still working on it. I have some numbers if you want on, the, on, on what I'm in particular doing right now. But anyway, um, from the language point of view, fr and from the, I think the, uh, the most interesting part here, maybe, is the fact that we are, we are able to do this at runtime really efficiently, uh, which is a problem that, I, that I, I really felt a lot, this problem, because uh, suppose that you have to run something really simple, uh, the completion time is really low, and uh, so, for example, we'll put it one millisecond. If you add 10 or 20 milliseconds just to, de to decide which device to use, you're wasting your time. So the idea is to, to go for a two-step or a pre-evaluation, which means that I try to, I can't extract uh, the, the, the value of a feature until I know the, the actual arguments, because some of the features, like the memory accesses, may depend on the particular uh, actual argument. So, but what I can do is to simplify the abstract syntax tree so that I get the minimum uh, or the most efficient version of the abstract syntax tree to, and, uh, and to end up the completion the, of the evaluation of this I'll, uh, um, only when I, I get a particular set of ar actual arguments. For example, this, this is a really straight example. Let's consider that this is uh, your kernel, and you want to compute the feature is number of memory accesses. Obviously, we have one memory access at the end, and then we have one memory access inside a loop, and the trip count of this loop is input.length plus one. So what I can do without knowing the, the, value, the value of the actual argument is to lift all the, 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 the things that are not relating, that are not contributing to the feature value, and try to, to understand what is going on inside the loops. And so I end up with, uh, I transform these into an arithmetic expression that computes the number of memory accesses as soon as I get the value of the actual argument. And this is really, really faster to do it every time I run a particular uh, computation than evaluating from scratch the entire abstract syntax tree. And so this makes possible to adopt this heterogeneous shadowing strategy also for very high the, the, from things that are quite simple, uh, like matrix addition, like Sobel filtering, that have a really low completion time. But since we are not putting any additional overhead, it is fine to, to try to automatically detect which is the best device. Uh, some early results, really, really early. Yeah, sure. Is that kind of, that's like an abstract interpretation of the 
definition or something of the code. Does it work if you're using the, the collection functions as well, uh, like map and so on? Yeah, that's straight because obviously the compiler knows everything about the code in that, in that specific case. Obviously, we have some restriction. We are trying to, to work on them. For example, the branch prediction is really use, would be really useful and efficient branch prediction to understand when or which threads uh, uh, enters a loop. Uh, by now, we are really doing, I have to be honest, we are doing a half, uh, half probability the branch of probability the else, but it's, uh, most of the time it's not like that. So we have to understand how um, uh, to, to apply some branch prediction. And uh, these are some early results. A problem that I faced at the beginning, and, and yeah, I thought about it a lot during this, this time, is that it's really great to program at a high level. It's really easier, uh, it's more productive, but if you go to some specific uh, high performance in contexts like fluid dynamic or something like that, generally what is really important is performance and it doesn't matter if the learning curve of the language you have to learn to, to, be, to be performant is, is high, say it takes quite a lot of time because the important thing is performances. But fortunately, thanks to to mostly to, to the way buffers are reused and data, tra tra data transfer, meaningless data transfer is avoided. Coding, the smart coding of, uh, of a C, um, OpenCL computation, has quite the same performance of coding uh, using FSCL, just because the same smart strategies that, is, that you apply in C, writing directly in OpenCL, are mostly the, the, the same strategies that FSCL, the, the FSCL runtime is used under the hood. And this is for matrix multiplication. I have also some other um, results for uh, um, vector addition and reduction, uh, probably prefix sum. And so for very, very small data, obviously like 64 by 64 matrices, obviously there is a setup time. So the, open, the, the C version is faster. But when we do raise the, the, the data size, uh, the, the two versions, the completion time is actually the same. And, this, uh, and uh, the, the, um, the speed, the co convergence speed uh, is here is really high because the matrix multiplication is quite complex in terms of complexity. Uh, and so the completion time of the kernel is really high. So the and and the completion time is the same in the in the, in the two versions because it's a price to pay because at the very end the FCL generates target code for matrix multiplication. So it generates OpenCL source code and then target code. In the other way, in, in, the, in the other solution, you directly translate OpenCL into target code. But at the end, the two target codes are, are the same. And this on the device is really pricing. It's really uh, have a re really great big completion time. And so it's really fast for the two solutions to converge to each other. In some other cases, for example, vector addition, the completion time of the kernel is really low. So you can see easier the, the gap for, for a small data. But eventually, you know, in both the cases, uh, there is some point, for example, in vector addition, I think it's around uh, 500k uh, bytes, uh, you have, um, you have the, co the, the two solution converge. So we, have, we are mostly, mostly of the time we, are, we have the same performance of uh, C solution, but we really, uh, the, the, the coding time is really simpler, the, the coding uh, approach. So I would like to end up with some notes and future, uh, citing future possibilities. Uh, one side note that for me is really, really important, uh, in particular for contribution, is that both the compiler and the runtime are thought from the beginning to be completely extensible, which means that at runtime, for example, every time you run a particular computation, you can tell uh, the runtime to compile using a different compiler. And when you instantiate a compiler, there are various type of configurations, but for example, you can use, you can define your own steps and the order of the steps. So 
from this point of view, the FCI compiler is more than an F# -sharp 2. OpenSea compiler is a dynamic compiler infrastructure, so you can dynamically define your compiler from time to time, and you may use it to translate F# -sharp into something completely different from OpenSea. Also, the runtime is now composed by is now a pipeline like a compiler of only two steps. The first is the flow graph builder, and the second is the executor of the computation. And you can replace this step or add your your own steps uh, at runtime. But maybe the, the most in, and this makes possible to for you to test it uh, with additional steps if you want to add some other features, for example, support for objects in FCL. But the most interesting thing is, that fa is the fact that every time I run a particular computation, I can use a different scheduling engine uh, or a different scheduling strategy, which means that I may, uh, this makes it possible to use, to, to change your, the way you prefer a device over the others from time to time, say every time you execute a particular computation. And this is part of the future possibilities. In particular, uh, I see many paths going on from, from FCL. One <coughs> is uh, porting integration with Roslyn, to the, which is the .NET compiler infrastructure, and that, gives, uh, that enables uh, to, to do all of these in C sharp, say in other languages. Uh, I, I would really like also to take into account uh, to the integration with Dandelion, which is um, a work from Microsoft Silicon Valley of one year and a an half ago, or two years ago. So at the same time I started thinking about FSCL. Uh, was trying, it's really inspiring, it was really inspiring. Anyway, they tried to do the same thing, but using link, so link operators instead of coding, instead of the object model that I use. Uh, so there are some limitations, but at the same point, they, t they can do the same things in, in, in C sharp out of the box. And uh, uh, so it would be quite cool to, to think about integrating, for example, the support to OpenCL. They do, they do use CUDA to OpenCL to, to Dandelion, or uh, for example, to, to enable Dandelion to, to do device aware. Uh, scheduling approach to adopt the device aware sh scheduling approach while they try to they, they use uh, device unaware which means I, so I treat all the devices as, as they were the same device and I use the first available device in a farm like way so uh, another interesting point of development may be um, right in the back end of the compiler and a support for the runtime to run on cloud cloud but to support cloud platforms Obviously, as I said, uh, we now are adopting uh, in a machine learning approach where the, the interesting thing, what I'm interested to monitor and, and the way I classify uh, different computation is based on completion time. So I want to choose the fastest device, but I may want to use the device that's uh, as lowest energy consumption, for example. In some contexts, it is really important. Or I may use both depending on, uh, on where the, the, the function, the, the, the kernel that I want to execute is declared. For example, I may say that if the, we may expose two different uh, API where, uh, the, where the functions that are declared in first API or under a certain namespace are scheduled on, uh, on a heterogeneous platform on an energy-based uh, with an energy-based approach, which means th these functions are, are not really uh, so important that I want the lowest completion time. What I want is the lowest energy consumption for this uh, task. And, uh, and, and if I instead use um, um, the functions that are declared inside another namespace, inside another API, those functions may be critical, so I want the lowest completion time, and so use a another scheduling strategy, and this completely transparent to the programmer uh, based on the fact that I may say in the runtime if the, uh, if the source of a particular kernel, if the kernel is declared inside a particular uh, namespace or module, just apply this scheduling strategy, otherwise uh, apply another one. Uh, I would really, really like to receive feedback from you now and uh, 
in a longer term. So if, if you would like to contribute to the development of this uh, uh, project, I'm, uh, it's on my shoulder right now. I'm the only developer, but I would really like to, to contribute. There are two main uh, GitHub repos, one of the compiler. So if you want to work only on the compiler, you may want to, to, to work on the runtime. The compiler is a submodule of the runtime. So if you want to use it, just clone the runtime and, and then uh, you need to update the submodule. Uh, there is a blog uh, that I have to update, actually, but uh, it's on and on FSCL, and there is also all the news uh, about FSCL. I post them on Twitter, and if you want to contact me directly, there is my mail and also Skype account. I think I'm up 24 hours a day uh, because I have no time to sleep lately, and. Uh, Thank you very, very much. Uh, I would be glad to, to, to receive some, if you have any question, I would be really, really glad to, to answer. Great, so we can start questions now. Oh. <laughs> questions, please? Yeah. Maybe I have one. Uh, you discussed a little bit about performance evaluation, but uh, so one thing I missed maybe is that if you have these complex constructs like Composition and then maybe a complex composition where you have to reuse the results of something else. So obviously yeah. there is this cost that you refer to of being read only or not, and then if it's not read only, you have yeah. to bring yeah, 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 it. You're right. Can you refer that? And, and so this one particular performance example was really seems to me. I mean that's why what I want to clarify. It seems like a very sim single kernel. Yeah. Which is just small again. Kernel. So there is no potential overhead. But if that's you write right. a more complex problem. Have you measured that, and is there more of it? We, we are doing it for, for a composition. Obviously, uh, there are two things to, to uh, understand. So the, the first is the fact that in kernel composition, I understand both from the compiler and from the runtime perspective that this is a composition. So for example, one thing that I do is that if a, a runtime, if, uh, sorry, a kernel, is returning uh, a buffer, to be used by the, the successive kernel. Uh, generally, what the, the approach is that the first kernel writes the buffer and the second kernel reads the buffer. But if I looked only on the specific kernel once at a time, I would allocate it the first time, I would allocate the buffer write only, and that I wouldn't be able to use it in the second kernel. But I detect this dependency, and so I allocate it in read-write, read so they both, can, they both can use it without data copy. I avoid data transfer in these particular situations. What is, you are right that there may be a change, in particular because uh, obviously now I have, uh, in this situation, I have multiple kernels, and every kernel introduces an overhead to be schedule to, to so there there will be an, a bigger overhead probably if i if i use a kernel expression i i'm still monitoring how much this overhead is uh, maybe related so you um, showed that uh, you could have this very simple linear composition and then sometimes you would need to break it if someone would need to yeah. refer to multiple things uh, so the the standard um, device in, in program languages is to have variables referring to the, the intermediate uh, uh, results and then referring to those variables. But it looked like you did not have the variables. It looked, you, you said that you just had everything in the pipeline available to it. Yeah, you mean that the results of execution of pieces are assigned to variables that are there in use in the following pieces, are you saying these? So that's why. I, I, yeah. That's how I would yeah. That, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So uh, let's think about this a minute. I, I may show it to you as an example, if I can. There we go. So, uh, so the idea is that, for example, let's consider my early vector addition. Seven. This is a bit okay. So, for example, here, I in the example one, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, the vector addition. I create the three arrays A, B, and C. C is written. The other two are read. So, uh, when I execute 
the decomputation here. Here I see the here she's change. So I may here do another computation that is using C. So that's the way they, the data is flow okay. from a computation to another. Obviously, since in, in this other example instead, which is not current form, but return type, I uh, use a uh, leverage on, a, on an introduction on, on a, an additional um, feature of FCL that OpenCL doesn't have, which is able to allocate something, which is then lifted out by the compiler anyway, because we can't allocate on the GPU. But uh, I can allocate the return uh, array here, and then I write it and I return it. In this case, you are right, this should be assigned to a variable, which is the result type. And here I can use C in another particular expression. Okay. If you assign it to a Nash sharp variable, in order to chain the two uh, kernel expressions on the device, does it have to flow back to the host before going back down to the device focus? Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's a good question. Uh, the approach now is that if I have, let me take one, uh, like this, you know, uh, if I have a composition of different kernels, th there is one which is the root. The root is obviously now is array sum, maybe a custom kernel. The root, if the root returns a buffer, it is transferred back to the device into an array because obviously the, the host may access it. Uh, lately, before another another uh, kernel is executed, but that's why we use uh, custom attributes because I may say do not transfer back the result of this of this uh, of this kernel because we know there is only uh, there is also a most intuitive uh, um, custom attributes which which is called not used. Since it is not used, I do not transfer back. And so I can, uh, if, I, if I say no transfer back here, here will not be transferred back. And I can therefore use the result, for example, here, and without the need to transfer back to the host and then to the device again. How do you refer to the result? Sorry? How do you refer to the result? Uh, no. in, that, in, the, in um, in the particular case of, uh, of a returning type, you can do this, but you have to use a parameter which is write only. Because obviously, uh, in OpenCL, in FCL, we have the concept of two different uh, type of buffers, which are called tracked and untracked. Untracked are those, exactly, those kind of buffers that I can't refer in the offside. Uh, obviously, the return buffer is untracked because it hasn't, doesn't have a name, but it's, a, it's really particular because uh, it is returned to the host in the particular case. And so if I want to do something like this, so you write into a parameter, do not transfer the content back to the host, and then execute another particular computation because I, I split the original expression, I have to use uh, a, a named parameter. So I can do, for example, in the original this, that it is not returning any value. Here I may say transfer mode, uh, what's it called? So we may use uh, no transfer, for example, and uh, should be like, we have to define what to do when the data is transferred has to be transferred to the, uh, from the host to the device, and we may say, okay, this transfer if needed. It, would, it won't be transferred because it's, re, uh, it's write only, so it won't be transferred anyway. But I may say this, and, and saying that when uh, the computation ends, I do no transfer. See? And so in this case, the, 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 the value is not transferred back to the array C. And so here I can, um, I can do something else without, without having the C updated, but this means that I can do some other pieces of the, of the, of the kernel expression without this, this overhand of transferring data. Yeah? Yeah? 
Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, so I just want to mention one thing which you, you actually can see here. First of all, it's running on the Mac, which is great to see F Sharp being used for, yeah, not only just being used on the Mac, but actually being used to do research on other platforms. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you can see one thing that we didn't see because we didn't see much live coding is you can do the heterogeneous programming in F Sharp Interactive, either on Windows or on the Mac, which for me, I think, is the immediacy of being able to do GPU or heterogeneous programming directly in the mm -hmm. REPL is a, is a great thing. Um, and uh, with, if you want to see more live coding with the framework, uh, Gabriel did give a talk a at skill Skills Matter last Thursday, which was mostly live coding. Yeah, that's and that's all recorded and on the, on the yeah. pod. Uh, the, 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 the screencast that's available uh, on the Skills Matter site, the, the, the invites that I spam around for Thursday evening down in London, if you're on that list. Uh, and with that, we'll uh, thank uh, everyone once more. And uh, great, thank you very much for the presentation. It's really